أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We start in the name of Allah the most gracious most merciful and we bear witness there is no deity worthy worship except Allah praise and glory be to him and that Muhammad is a seal of messengers he was sent as a mercy to all mankind may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him his family his companions and those who followed his path and the day of judgment. I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And this is our A to Z show with uh, your host, Dr. Abdul Aziz, and our guest, Brother Asad Al-Zaman. And uh, of course, you can always uh, email us on uh, admin at Radio Hajj online. And Salah Radio Hajj uh, will be uh, online as well for you for the month of Ramadan as well. Uh, and you can go online and it is full of programs for you to keep you busy as well. And uh, of course, uh, uh, there's a lot of things to cover. And we start, inshallah, of course, the uh, we are uh, om- almost uh, two days uh, uh, today and uh, tomorrow, I think, uh, to away from uh, Ramadan. And uh, of course, the uh, always we have this issue about uh, moon sighting, although I can tell you that the moon, the new moon is born at three, uh, I think 3.15 to uh, at uh, 3.15 on Sunday, and therefore it will be impossible to see it anywhere for two days, and therefore we'll be going for 30 days of Sha'aban, and normally Ramadan should be on Tuesday. I want to ask you, why the why the I send uh, uh, the European Council fatwa and research talking about how important is astronomy and calculation and they have said that if astronomy said it's impossible to see it and somebody claim he has seen it it's by error or by fabrication, but why Muslims still just uh, talking about uh, any fast when you see it and uh, break your fast when you see it and still. Uh, uh, sticking to this issue, you know, about every month. No, normally this is sorted out by astronomy, and normally astronomy was actually pioneered by Muslims because it's part of our religion. Okay, the five daily prayers, the Hajj, all of them are based on calculation of time and seasons as well. But uh, the question, brother, as a man, is why people still, still, they don't, they don't. Uh, Everybody now is putting a, a, a lecture about it, and everybody is a scholar, you know? Very simple. Walaikum salam. Salam alaikum to every, everyone listening and watching. Um, this is an issue that's going to go on and on until there is Muslim unity on this issue. Now, you, you talked about... Um, I think you mentioned Moss uh, coming together and agreeing on the Ramadan timetable. Yeah, well, 13, 13 mosques, yeah. Yeah. And that's a that's a big start. Um, and my hope and our hope, of course, is that they can agree on the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan. Okay. Because if they can agree on the timetable, then hopefully they can agree when it starts and when it finishes. Yeah, I think they put the 13th of... Uh... April as Tuesday as a beginning of first of Ramadan, yes. Let's hope that they stick to that because you know what happens always. You've been involved in this. I've been involved in this over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a, <clears throat> a group of them coming together uh, from different mosques, different denominations, Muslims, and they will agree on something and then they go back to their mosques and then the agreement is worth nothing. They go their own ways. And so there's no unity. And because there's no unity, this is a problem that we are going to suffer until Imam Mahdi comes. (laughs) And this is the reality. Yeah, but the- When we can agree, when we have some unity and have some trust in each other, then you will find that we will come to an agreement on the criteria. And, you know, it's really not rocket science. It's not difficult. 
But when there's no unity, the simplest thing becomes very difficult. And that's all there is to it. Either you agree on a calculation, everyone says, okay, whatever this particular must decides this year, we all agree on it. We all agree on it. Whether it's a calculation, whether it's sighting of the moon with the eyes or whatever it is. And um, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. They won't agree on one particular criteria. And they can, they can uh, chain the different masks. They can not say this year we'll have this mask and just pick out names from a, from a hat. Okay. And then once one mask is chosen, that's it for that particular, the next 10 years, 20 years, you know, you've sorted the problem out. It's just, you randomly pick out a name, a neutral person does it, have it televised or, you know, on social media and say, look, this was done totally fairly. A name out of a, a hat of a mosque, whenever they decide, everyone decides on the same day. So whether that mosque decides based on, you know, moon sighting or whether it's on calculation or whether it's on Saudi Arabia, or whether it's on this country or Morocco or whatever, whatever that must decide, everyone just follows that. How easy and simple would it be? What difference does it make whether we start on Tuesday or Wednesday? Makes no difference at all. But it's about unity. Agree on one principle and let every, you know, put names of every mosque in a hat and every time we have uh, you know start of Ramadan or end of Ramadan just choose a different you know just pick out a, mo a mosque from the hat and let them decide and everyone goes with it so there we are there's your solution and uh, you know this Ramadan you know you spoke you just mentioned Saudi Arabia and uh, Morocco uh, why the, the Ramadan is a scholarly issue based on uh, a knowledge and uh, science of astronomy and everything? Why they, why they play with it on politics? Why, why they use it for politics? You know, why, why they don't get out completely out of it? They have nothing to do with it. Some people like unity and others don't. Uh, some people most may feel unity is not in their interest. And for example, you know, if there is unity, then there is a lot of uh, talk of having a one single um, Jama'a prayer, uh, say in uh, Platfields Park or one of these parks. Yeah, we, we have done it before, yes. Manchester Eid Festival, yes. But you see, that means that the mosques, which normally hold the Eid prayer, they miss out on thousands of pounds of donations. Of, uh, donations. So, right. So, you know, uh, politically, economically, some of them feel, may feel, that uh, it's not in their interest to go along with everybody else. Right. Allah, okay. May Allah give us unity. Let's move on. Okay, right. Uh, our mosque as well, you know, they have decided that they will uh, do Isha prayer, and then some of them, they do it for one hour, uh, two uh, tarawih prayers and I think the last 10 days they will do itikaf as well therefore one hour before Fajr as well and the other thing as well they decided that those people who have a, uh, underlying health condition will not be allowed to come and as well children under 12 or something they will not be allowed to come as well and uh, the idea of course you know that the tarawih is a sunnah anyway it's not compulsory. For therefore, That's right. For therefore, you can, uh, like we did it in the lockdown last year, we prayed, all of us, we prayed at home. That's right. And I think that really, you've just, you mentioned the most important point there. Look, when there is a risk, okay, when there is a risk of uh, potential harm, then the obvious thing is, that you don't put yourself in harm's way. You minimize that risk. And if it's a sunnah, then quite simply, you know, a prayer at home. Uh, important thing is, of course, that you do uh, do some prayers at home until, uh, you know, this uh, issue of the virus 
um, subsides and maybe we've got herd immunity or majority of the people are vaccinated. And so um, there's a lower risk of, of uh, transferring the, uh, the illness to anybody else. I think these are the sort of things that uh, we need to be thinking about. So personally, uh, I agree. Um, you know, until this virus situation is sorted out, I don't think there should be any prayer which is um, not vital. I mean, apart from the FOD prayers, um, and of course, for those, it's all social distancing and uh, about a seventh of the number of people who can normally go are, are going uh, because of the lack of space. Mm. Uh, so we just have to live with it. I, we've discussed this before. I think they mm. should, all of us should get together and, and but you more prayers and even the five day prayers, the Dravi prayers, say, look, it's acceptable on Zoom. Just pray with your local mosque uh, at home uh, on Zoom and it's acceptable and you will get the same reward of you know 27 prayers or whatever because of these extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, because I think some scholar, the European Council of Antwerp said, said, I think as far as the Sunni is concerned, it's not a problem. But uh, as we mentioned before, Friday, it is not. Uh, that's uh, not right as well, because we did listen to the khutbah and then we have to play the harp at home as well. Now, let's move on in um, fasting and for children. Now, you know that they are on holiday now, and they, they are, I think, uh, up to next week. And, and sometimes, you know, the children, out of curiosity, they start thinking about, you know, uh, fasting and how can we encourage children fast? But I said, do not send them as young as uh, 10 or 10 years old as well to a primary school fasting because the fast is almost at least, I think, I mean, it's eight o'clock now and uh, it's almost five, five o'clock, it's about 18 hours. Um, what is your? No, it's about 15, 16 hours. Yeah, uh, 15, 16 hours. Sorry, yes. And uh, now, what is your advice to the parents who have children and they want to fast, encourage them to fast? First of all, what is the age children will be encouraged to fast? I mean, look, I mean, yeah, I mean, I. this is, you know, uh, a very simple one, really. Um, so far as children are concerned, yes, we should be giving them practice. I mean, look, look at uh, Salah. Uh, the Prophet has told us from the age of seven, yes. you, you start training them, okay, encourage them, but no forcing them. Yes. So for three solid years, you are just training them. And so, it, and then at the age of 10, it becomes compulsory on them. Yes. But if we apply the same logic to uh, fasting, quite simply, at an early age, especially when they want to join in, maybe a five-year-old or six-year-old, let them fast for maybe a couple of hours. Ah, oh, okay. For a very, very short period. And then perhaps uh, an hour or so, maybe two hours before uh, iftar, say, okay, your fast starts now. And then they, the child can break the fast with the rest of the family. Hmm. And they will have felt that, you know, they, have, they would have had some experience of, of the fast. Um, and of course, as they grow older, you know, six, seven, eight, then they can increase the length of time. And I think by the time the child is about seven, eight, or certainly on one or two days, maybe on a weekend. Of, when oh, off Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, yes. Yeah, let them, let them fast for the whole day, especially now for the next maybe 15, 20 years, it's going to be quite easy. Because it's getting shorter and shorter. Yes, yeah. Uh, so, you know, for the next certainly 10, 15, 18 years, um, it, it'll be around b between uh, 15 and, and, of course, in December, it'll be just nine hours and yes. I mean, that nothing. Yeah, mm. uh, nine hours. Um, so, yes, gradually get them into it, wean them in, just as, they, as mothers do with their children in terms of. Uh, um, first of all, it's milk only when the child is born, and they start feeding them um, food after maybe you know uh, a few months, six, seven, eight months, nine months. Uh, start giving them uh, baby food, but which is completely almost like liquid, 
and then gradually with it when the teeth start growing as well uh but by the time they're one one and a half then they can start eating uh proper food so we get them used to so they, you know it's a gradual process gradual process and help them to understand the importance of fasting as well but obviously not to be oppressive on them so by the time they are i would say i mean i don't think in islam there is a particular age because you know unlike pr prayer prayer of course is not a, a physically demanding thing but prayer yes. what fasting is yes and therefore it depends on the child and every parent knows whether their child can handle it or not and if they've been through this gradual process since the age of five or six with a couple of hours here one hour there um, you know two three hours get them gradually you know used to staying without food for some time mother knows okay my child is ready now to take uh, full responsibility and i think from the age of 10 i mean you've taught 10 year olds i've taught thousands of 10 year olds and i know on average the average 10 year old can easily handle all um you know 29 30 fasts uh, without too much difficulty it's certainly 11 year old but i'd say even a 10 year old therefore you're talking about a second secondary school now the secondary school there is an issue uh, do if the children are going to secondary school 11 12 years old and of course year 7 to uh, year 11 there is two issues one is that do you need to send a letter to the uh, to the school to tell them my son is fasting i think that's a good idea uh, but i think before that there needs to be a meeting between the head and uh, some parents. Uh -huh. That meeting is really, really crucial for the head to understand. Uh, what, you know, there needs to be this needs to be planned between the parents and the head. Because there there's a, health, be a risk, planned. risk. You see, there's a risk. Yeah. Yeah. So it needs to be planned between them, and no doubt they can come to uh, an agreement in terms of. You know, not um, so reducing, for example, the activities of the child uh, during the month of Ramadan in terms mm -hmm. of PE and running around. And but you know, I, I'm beginning to change my attitude uh, to uh, kind of trying to conserve your energy in Ramadan because the one thing that we have learned in recent years from scientists and yes. most of the non-Muslim scientists is that actually in Ramadan. The body reacts in a way as to release more energy. Yes. Uh, so, because of the impact of fasting on the human body, and therefore, actually, we should theoretically, certainly, um, have more energy uh, in this month rather than less energy. So, um, certainly, anything that makes you very thirsty, too much running around, etc., especially if the weather is hot, uh, that's not uh, recommended. But general work, I don't think it should uh, really uh, be impacted by fasting. So okay. yes, let the parents and the teach and the head teacher let them have a meeting, discuss the matter openly, and then and there won't be a problem. Because in the past, uh, I know many many primary schools they banned primary school children from yeah, actually fasting. fasting yes. yes, and that really should not happen. That should not happen. But you uh, know, you know, for the month of Ramadan. If I look to the mainstream media, they don't speak about it at all. Well, they do mention it that, you know, Ramadan is coming and uh, there, there is the odd article. I've seen the odd article in, in The Guardian, in this in the various newspapers. Um, and I have in the past anyway, not in uh, last uh, one or two years, but about three years ago, the BBC invited me down to their uh, studio. Uh, here in Manchester, and um, I remember, uh, I think it was just before Ramadan started, um, I gave, I think, probably about 15 or 20 interviews within one and a half hours. Oof, uh, right. All of the uh, local BBC radio stations, mm. and they, they organized it between them, that I would be coming on for maybe two, three minutes on one, and then immediately two, three minutes for the next one, and immediately two, three minutes 
on the next one. Just basically snap, snap, snapshot, yeah. Yeah. So about three, four minutes, maybe four, three, four minutes, depending on the, the registration, how many questions they want to ask me. Uh, but yes, uh, and and within one and a half hours, you can imagine how many registrations I went through uh, right. throughout the entire country. So um, th there is some coverage. Uh, perhaps there could be more coverage, but th there is some coverage. Okay, and do you think that the mosque have to play a role when before Ramadan to to use Ramadan as a da'wah project, you know? Because Ramadan, as you said, fasting, uh, I did some research about, you know, uh, the uh, what is alcohol and drugs addiction, you know, rehabilitation costs about £1,000 uh, a month, 4000 uh, 28 days up to 10,000, you know, and a lot of, especially I always find it amazing, the new Muslims, how they give up uh, drinking and drugs and everything. Yeah, subhanAllah, you look, uh, the, the uh, increase in Iman, increase in Taqwa. Uh, God, the God fear, yes, okay. Yeah, and, yeah Taqwa, God consciousness. Yes. Um, can develop a, a, an extraordinary level of willpower within uh, a, an individual. And uh, things that you d did not dream of being able to give up, you are able to give them up. Uh, because of that level of God consciousness that has entered you and that you know, strength of faith um, allows you to develop that willpower and self-control and self-discipline mm. to overcome the addictive uh, nature of, for example, alcohol or drugs or whatever. So, you know, the human being is an extraordinary creature. Uh, yes, we have got our weaknesses and there are, you know, uh, certain chemicals which are triggered as a result of taking drugs and stuff. Um, but it, the important thing is that um, we endeavor to do our best to try and, you know, stay within the boundaries that Allah SWT has uh, given us and, and to do those things, indulge in those actions that he has made a fault. And as we indulge in them, and of course, you know, we will become stronger. Here's another thing though, you see, um, Allah SWT has customized this month of Ramadan. We're now talking about Ramadan. Mm. He has customized this month for the purpose of raising your taqwa. How? Well, the Prophet ﷺ told us that in this when Ramadan starts, the doors of heaven are opened and the yes. doors of hell are closed. Yes. And the shaitan, the Satan, the devil, is chained up. Now, let's examine this because. If the shaitan is chained up, if the devil is chained up, why is it that we still commit sins? We generally commit sins because of the devil. He tempts us. So if he's chained up, then why do people still commit sins? I mean, sins don't stop in Ramadan. Well, the answer is a very simple one. Um, imagine a man, for example, being chained to a wall. So he's there, chained up, can't move. Now, as you come closer to that person and they talk to you, you can hear what they're saying. But as you move away from them, well, they can't come with you. They have to stay there because they're chained up. As you move away from them, the whispering or, the, or their voice becomes less audible. And the further you move away, the less you are going to hear. And that is basically what happens with shaitan. The only influence that shaitan has over us is whispering and temptation. He can encourage us to do something. We can choose to do it or choose not to do it. Now, the more we worship Allah, and that's what Ramadan is about. It is a month of worship where we intensify our worship. 
where the normal uh, shackles that stop us from going to the mosque or, or praying, they are removed. SubhanAllah, we all experience it, we all feel it. And the result is that in Ramadan, the mosques are much more full for every prayer than they are outside of Ramadan. And even, you know, Fajr prayer, which sadly is um, only a very small number of people normally turn up uh, in a mosque or even get up, uh, you know, even at home to pray. Mm -hmm. In Ramadan, we suddenly see that that is no longer the case. Many more people go to the mosque to pray. Many more people will pray their Fajr at home. And of course, they, we become much more conscious. So you see, Ramadan is about uh, conditioning and controlling the nafs, the control. Now, so what things influence us? I'm talking about the customization of Ramadan for the purpose of raising our taqwa. So raising our taqwa, becoming uh, more God conscious, more conscious of Allah, SWT, developing more fear of Allah, and at the same time, developing a far greater control over our bodies so that we can control the amount of sin because sin is you know we all know we commit sins with our eyes our ears our mouths our hands etc and in this month because of the level of taqwa that is um, uh, elevated within each of us some more than others of course we are able to control those organs through which we commit sins and Therefore, we are really disciplining the soul. So what are the impacts? It's all about the soul, the ruh. And what are the influences on that? One is shaitan and one is nafs. So the shaitan, as he becomes chained up, you see outside of Ramadan, the shaitan follows us everywhere. Wherever we go, the shaitan follows us. But in Ramadan, the shaitan is chained up. So the more we worship Allah, the closer we come to Allah, the more distance we create between ourselves and the shaitan. Mm -hmm. okay. We become further and further. So the more we worship, if the shaitan is there, we are moving away. And therefore, the whispering of the shaitan becomes less. And therefore, the influence of the shaitan upon us becomes less. So we commit less sins. And that's, that brings us closer to Allah. Now, the so last thing, I think. Mm, yes, that's the last. Thing. Yes, okay. Now, what is the second influence on, this, on the soul? Second influence, which, which could be negative, is your nafs, your desires. Now, Here's the interesting thing about the nafs. We generally see the nafs as a, a bad thing. But the nafs is neither good or bad. The nafs is desire. We can condition and discipline the nafs so that it doesn't just desire bad, it desires good. Because if we enjoy for example, worshipping Allah. We enjoy giving money to charity. The nafs will say to us, "Give, do more of this. Do more. The nafs doesn't care. The nafs wants pleasure. So you may get pleasure through committing haram, or you may get pleasure from doing halal. So in Ramadan, what we are doing is we should start to enjoy worship much more and the more we spend uh, in, during worship the more we are going to enjoy doing that worship okay. that's really important i've experienced it and i'm sure you've experienced it mm. that sometimes you are enjoying your salah so much you do not want to stop Probably. you want to First of all, you slow down every word you say. You slow it down and you think about it. You reflect over it. 
you try to imagine subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika you know you 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 can just imagine the glory of allah you are reflecting upon the amazing universe and the galaxies and everything else allah has created you say subhanallah you know subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika and then you are thanking allah for everything and imagine you are this is going through your head and you're doing it slowly very slowly then surah al-fatiha you're reading it very slowly reflecting upon every word you're saying oh allah it is only you we worship and of course the concept of worship is also going through your head what is worship you know and and only you we uh, ask for istiana. What is the concept of istiana when, when you say only you we ask for help? That concept, if we understand it, we reflect upon it. And you know, what is what is hidayah? What is hidayah? You're asking Allah to guide you along the Surat al-Mustaqim. What does that mean? So we, we will discuss as al fatiha in some detail some other time. Right. But the important thing is, the point I'm trying to make is that in this month, forget about time. Forget about rushing. Take your time over your Salah. Your five minutes for four far should become 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Spend more time in sujood and ruku. Spend more time just pondering over the words you are, you, you are uttering and reflect over its meaning. Okay, inshallah. Then you will enjoy your salah. Okay, you I think the, the last question is, whether uh, I think it's an issue, with Muslims, you know, uh, grown-ups in high school and everything. What is your advice to a parent whose son or daughter, they don't fast? Well, if they've done their job and they've encouraged them to fast from the age of four or five, as we discussed earlier, then that won't be a problem. They'll already be used to it by the time it becomes fard upon them and mom and dad feel, yes, my child can handle the fast now, not just a few fast, but all the fast. It won't even be an issue. But if you've never discussed it and the child has never fasted until you know, 10 years of age, then it may well become a bit of an issue. So really, if you don't want your child to say no at the age of 10, then make sure that you are slowly grooming them into the idea of fasting from an early age. Mm, right. Okay. Now, uh, okay, national, let's go to, uh, you know, the death of uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, after 73 years of marriage with Elizabeth II. He died uh, at the age of 99, 100 almost, uh, minus two months anyway. I think we, we always say, uh, behind uh, every man there is a, a great woman but uh, do we have this as well behind a great woman there is a great man well i've you know i've got a rough idea as to how he lived um apparently he was quite a um a competent admiral or, or quite a, a competent um uh, person in the Navy hmm. um, and he had a good career going there um, uh, certainly I've heard a lot of praise from those who worked with him in the Navy uh, but of course that was a very long time ago in his youth um, so although we generally tend to see him as a rather incompetent uh, individual um, the reality is that uh, you know, he was quite a competent uh, person, you know, a Navy man. Um, 
But then, of course, suddenly he had to leave the Navy, something that he really regretted because he enjoyed mm. it. And, um, because his wife, Princess Elizabeth, became Queen Elizabeth yes. when George, her um, father, suddenly died. Uh, so she becomes queen at a very, very early age, I think 20 something. Um, and of course, it is, it's a bit bewildering for most people why he didn't become king. But anyway, he didn't. And he's got a sort of um, Greek and I think German and Russian blood inside him anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, as soon as he becomes, of course, you know, uh, she becomes, his wife becomes queen. He has to leave the Navy. And then it's a kind, it's a basically, he has to support the queen wherever he goes. And, you know, that was a, must have been a very, very difficult thing for him as a man to do, to be mm. basically number two. I mean, you know, a man is used to being the decision maker and, uh, you know, number one. But he always had to play second fiddle uh, to the queen, it, basically just accompanying her everywhere. She was always the, the central, you know, figure of attention. And he was like on the side, just uh, holding her hand more or less. Uh, so he had to somehow um, present himself as, yes, being there to basically, uh, I, I suppose, in, in a way, the, the reason that Hawa was created for Adam and Islam, <laughs> right, to, to be a company for him, if yes. you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's there for exactly the opposite. It, it, it's the queen <laughs> who is a central figure, and he's there to simply accompany her. Support her, yeah. Yes. Uh, and so he was, you know, he had to put, you know, uh, queen and country first, and his career second. And that's how he, he's lived for decades. Um, but of course, he's not going to be known for his. Uh, um, you know, his Navy abilities. He's going to be well known for the crazy stuff that he's well known for. Uh, he, you know, he, the gaps. Uh, some of them are racist. Uh, others are uh, just um, strange. Uh, he, he liked to, you know, he, he just, whatever came into his head, he just came out of his mouth. Uh, for example, one of the... Um, former, I think, pr Prime Minister of um, Canada was saying on Radio 4 this morning that uh, when he came to Canada, the when this guy who was talking, he said, I, you know, he was the, I think, Prime Minister or, or whatever of Canada. And um, he decided to, I don't know, if it was some occasion, and he decided to wear a Nigerian dress. <laughs> and Prince Philip, when he went to visit him, said, are you ready for bed or something? <laughs> <laughs> so he was making fun of his, his Nigerian dress like this is like pajamas. <laughs> so he was not very diplomatic. Um, he went to a labor meeting of uh, female um, sort of labor uh, MPs, I think it was. And um, it, all women, of course. And so he says, oh, so you must be the, uh, the feminist brigade or something. All right. <laughs> so he didn't care who he was talking to. He, he came yeah. out with his um, offensive stuff. He was right. on the um, uh, Great Wall of China a few years ago. I remember that like yesterday. I think it must have been about 10 years ago. And um, he's got these hundreds. And this, this they showed on television. There were hundreds of these Chinese, uh, mostly young people, who were all surrounding him. Okay, and he's in the middle there. And a, uh, a British student uh, came towards him uh, as he was surrounded by these Chinese. And Prince Philip shouted at him, don't stay here too long, otherwise you'll get slitty eyes. <laughs> <laughs> And it, this is caught on camera. Out of the blue, yeah. It, 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 this is caught on camera. I mean, yeah. how racist could you be? Oh, I, mean, yes. I mean, that is just pure, you know, racism. Mm. Uh, to make fun of their eyes, etc., like that. I think, uh, I think, 
And uh, yeah, there are were... many other, many, many other instances like that, uh, that, um, you know, he could be accused of racism, of, of just opening his mouth when he shouldn't, and just saying crazy things. Right. And uh, I think the, on the, I think the, they will do a royal funeral, not a state funeral as well. Boris Johnson is not going because of COVID-19 guidelines. And I think the, uh, I think the whole uh, funeral will be, I think, between family members uh, as well on the next Saturday, 17th of April. Uh, I think uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, they may be local as well. This is just not uh, this uh, petition about headscarf in uh, uh, issue in France. And Afzal Khan MP put that uh, petition. It's almost around. Maybe I think I left it yesterday, about 136,000 people have it. But there was a lot of people uh, not happy about it. He said, why he dealt, he is dealing with a, a French issue. Muslim in France should deal with their own business. And why he didn't actually do the same for uh, sex education, you know, sex and relationship education. Look, these are politicians, and politicians will do whatever is necessary to get them elected and, you know, go, go up the political ladder. So, you know, you just have to ask yourself that question. He must have sat down and said, is this in my interest or is it not in, in my interest? Will this get me more votes or less votes? And if he comes to the conclusion this is going to get him more votes, then he's going to go for it. And if it's going to get him less votes, then he won't go for it. You know, the politicians can't, uh, unfortunately, you know, have too many morals and and uh, conscience and stuff. Um, it's their political careers that come first. And in this situation, he judged that, you know, it would be better for his political career if he did this. And with the LGBT situation, he felt that it was not in his interest uh, to not support the LGBT community with, uh, you know, with his votes. So, so him and the other M Muslim MPs, they went along with it. So, mm. unfortunately, but once people get into politics, then um, there's an erosion of their iman, there's an erosion of their values and principles, and it soon becomes much more clear to them that they have to put their political uh, careers and whatever is good for their political careers first, and their own personal, you know, beliefs and values second. Okay. Uh, and that, you know, is for probably most politicians. All right. Um, the important thing is, I mean, you've just, you mentioned France. You see, France is heading towards, I think, total disaster. I'll tell you what I think may happen. You see, France is now creating a pressure cooker uh, situation for its Muslim community. Everybody knows this is an anti-Muslim um, sort of bill that's going through, that's gone through now, it's got to be approved, where, you know, you just can't wear a headscarf. That's it. That's it. There's no ifs or buts about it, whether in school, outside of school, whether you're a girl or a woman or, or whoever you are, okay? Um, because this is very openly an expression of Muslimness, to be a Muslim. Of course, the fact that Virgin Mary, uh, Mari Mal Islam, mm. <laughs> wore a headscarf, they don't care. And this is supposed to be a Catholic country. Yes. So the whole idea of secular liberalism, laissez-faire, I think they call it. Laissez-faire, yes. Laissez-faire. Um, mm. This is, you know, they've taken this to the extreme. In all Western countries, you've got laissez-faire, you've got secularism. But in France, they've decided to be an extremist form of secularism, a very fundamentalist and extremist um, form, uh, and what they would probably call a pure form, um, resulting in any expression of religiosity, any expression from the day you're born to the day you die, that has to be wiped out because your faith must be in your home or in your place of worship. 
once you step out on the street or you are outside of your home and outside of your place of worship, then you are an ordinary member of the Republic and therefore you need to behave like everybody else. In Rome, do as Romans do. In Paris, in Paris, you do as the Parisians do. And okay. that is the message of Macron uh, and of France to its um, over 6 million population. Right. Most what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Uh, what I think is going to happen. You will have a small group who says, to hell with what the, these measures. And they will create, they will form a very extremist group that will create problems for the state. And they will indulge more probably in criminal behavior and will give the rest of the 6 million Muslims even you know, a, a more worse reputation and create more friction and more problems for the Muslims of France, as well as the general population of France. This is going to explode because Muslims are not going to tolerate being crushed and crushed and, you know, in this situation, the pressure cooker is going to explode. So France is being very irresponsible. We know why they're doing it. They're telling the, the far right electorate, we are more anti-Muslim than Marine Le Pen, the, far, mm. the National Front. We are more anti-Muslim. So don't vote for her, vote for us. Right. Okay. I mean, this is it's about politics. We know it's about politics. Okay. I think we follow up with that file anyway. Uh, uh, I think let's move on to uh, uh, Northern Ireland and uh, tension between the loyalist and unionist uh, community. Very, very disturbing incidents well, when you see yeah. when you this <laughs> you see. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this was predicted. This was predicted. Mm. And now those who are against Brexit, they are saying, look, we told you, don't go for this. You're going to destroy the uh, United Kingdom. And that is a direction that things are going. Because you see, Boris Johnson has been proven to be a liar on many, many occasions. And they are accusing him now of lying again, when it came to uh, treating Northern Ireland differently to the rest of the United Kingdom. He, he said, no, there'll be no border control, there'll be no this. It's all happening. So the natural direction things are now taking is that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will join together again. Because, I, because, no because uh, can we just, uh, Ireland is still part of the uh, European Union, isn't it? Right. In the, U uh, the Republic of Ireland, which, of which the, the capital is Dublin, yes, that is a totally separate country to yes. the UK. Yes. And okay. they are part of the EU. Yes. All right. And economically, they're doing extremely well. Okay? They are doing extremely well. It's only a small population, but they're doing well for various reasons, uh, technology and what have you. Mm. The United Kingdom as Britain, France, America, uh, no, Britain, France, <laughs> what am I talking about? Brit uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, okay? These are part of the UK. Now, when the referendum for uh, the EU happened, people in Northern Ireland and Scotland voted in favor, in majority voted in favor of the EU. To stay with the EU, yes. To stay with the EU, but England, the majority, very small majority, yes. voted to stay. To, Four to five to, percent, yes. To leave, yeah? It's a very small mm. majority. I think it's something like 41, 48, 51, 48 or something like that. Yeah. Only a couple of percent more. So, uh, and, and the Welsh, I believe, also as well. So, now that people can see the negative impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland, they are saying, okay, you know, this is not what we were promised. This is not what we were told. Uh, and the result is that, you know, there's all this violence. 
Um, but I and, just ask you why why a political issue is gone down to the to the harmony of the community. You know why it went to that kind of violence between the unionist and the loyalist. You know and the, it is a political issue. Why we cannot sort it politically instead of sorting it in the streets? Because uh, Boris Johnson promised the people of Northern Ireland uh, certain conditions which he has not met, and they're angry. Uh, and and they, you are seeing their anger. It's as simple as that. So. What we are seeing now, as said, is the breakup of the United Kingdom. That's what we are seeing. And it won't be too long before, uh, I think, um, especially if we see the economic situation in England getting seriously worse, which I think it will. I think uh, we are heading for a complete disaster. The West as a whole is heading for a complete disaster. But the U, but the England in particular is, or the UK. As the economic situation in the next five years becomes seriously bad in the UK, Scotland, the Scottish are likely to say, "Okay, we want to grab onto the EU. We don't want to drown with England." And the Northern Irish will say, "We also want to." be part of uh, the EU, and of course that means becoming one with the Republic of Ireland again. Mm. Because the Republic of Ireland is already in the EU. So that's where I think things are going. Give it another five to ten years and possibly you will have, uh, you know, England by itself, possibly Wales uh, as a separate country, uh, Scotland as a separate country, and Northern Ireland as a separate country. Maybe you may find that uh, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland may decide to become one country, uh, separate to England. So, you know, mm. all of these things uh, could possibly happen. Okay, right. Uh, let's move on on uh, this uh, Zionist lobby and its interference in the UK. Politics, Sir Alan Duncan blasts pro Israeli lobby over disgusting interference in UK politics. Well, it's not surprising. Al Jazeera uh, did an excellent documentary a few years ago, which exposed um, the uh, some, some members of the uh, Israeli embassy uh, in London. Uh, for uh, interfering in in uh, British politics and deciding who's going to be the leader and who isn't and what policies are going to be pushed, uh, I mean, you know, they they will do anything to make sure that, um, say, the British Parliament or the uh, American Parliament or possibly Australian, Canadian, maybe French. Uh, that they will act in the favor of Israel uh, and therefore to put into power those people who are you know, pro-Israeli uh, Zionists. So that, that really shouldn't surprise us. Um, what surprises me is Alan Duncan was brave enough to, uh, to say what he said, uh, you know, to, to be critical of them. Uh, that, mm. That's what surprises me because, you know, <laughs> because of the, there might be a small number. I mean, there's, there's supposed to be about 200,000 in Britain, Jews. Uh, but the influence is immense. 25% uh, of all billionaires in the UK are, are Jewish. And, and, and no doubt, uh, most of them, if not all of them, are Zionist. So the, the, the power is there. Numbers may be small, but you don't need huge numbers. You just need the influence. Um, and therefore, and especially, uh, in a, uh, now, when Israeli politics itself is in a mess, they've had God knows five, six yes. elections in four or five years. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't decide who's going to rule. I think that they re realize they're all incompetent, mm -hmm. um, and and Israel is a, a bit of a mess. Um, and then, of course, you've got all these 
um, politics going on in the Middle East with the Saudis and the Emiratis and, and these other Gulf countries jumping in bed with Israel. And yeah, it's, it's a complete, it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess uh, as to what is actually happening. But definitely, you know, uh, the Israelis uh, will do what they can to make sure that they have plenty of influence uh, in this country. Um, mm. Whether they use legitimate and do, do, and, and do you think that no. this this issue, which has been risen by Sir Alan Duncan, like in America, when they thought about the Russian interference in uh, United States affairs and everything, they put an inquiry. Do you think that we should the we should they should trigger a national inquiry? We can ask for it, but you should you should understand something. Uh, most people per perhaps don't know that the Conservative Friends of Israel, which is a very, very powerful Zionist lobby, which has about, I don't know, 70, maybe over 70 percent of all Conservative MPs are members of that Conservative Friends of Israel. They will always act in the interest of Israel and they will protect Israel. And that includes, you know, these Muslim MPs as well. Uh, like you had Sajid Javed and others uh, who were supposed to be, well, at least, you know, he, he's got a Muslim name and a, and a Muslim family. Um, but yeah, the, these people, the, the most powerful of, of the lobbies, of course, you've got your as a Conservative Friends of Israel, CFI, and also Labour Friends of Israel, also very powerful uh, pro-Israeli lobby. And of course, you've got your uh, Jewish Board of Deputies. So these these are powerful lobbies that will always act in the interests of Israel. So we shouldn't be surprised that uh, they are interfering in this way. Okay. Uh, let's, I think, move on because I think time is running very fast. Uh, world News, you know, uh, the 9th of April, 1948, the massacre in Diri Yassin. And of course, the uh, the terrorist organization, the Haganah, and all this slaughtered almost 130 uh, innocent people, which caused almost 700,000 to leave their land and their houses. Uh, and the ICC, the International Criminal Court, has been denied to gather evidence of crime against humanity, of genocide, in Israel, why, why is that? Influence, power. Um, America will always protect um, Israel. And also, of course, remember, America itself did not sign up to the ICC, and I don't think Israel has signed up to the ICC. So, uh, although you can just check to see whether Israel has signed up, I know America refuses to. Yes. Because America knows that its troops are going to end up in The Hague for war crimes. What happened in so, Afghanistan and Iraq and all this? Yeah, they know they will end up in The, in the Hague. So they refuse to have anything to do with, with the ICC. And uh, Israel similarly knows uh, that um, if it opens up its doors to the ICC, it will end up, its, its soldiers, its generals, uh, will end up like the Nazis in Nuremberg. So uh, why should they open, you know, why should they allow the ICC in when they know what's going to happen? So there we are. It's power and influence. Okay. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Right. Now, the other thing, tension in Russia, Crimea and Ukraine. This is, uh, this is a war, like a cold war almost, or maybe more than a cold war going on between Russia and, and America. Ukraine is kind of between them. Uh, Russia is trying to uh, control Ukraine and, uh, and the West is trying to uh, control Ukraine. Um, and there are uh, Russian speaking Ukrainians and uh, non-Russian speaking Ukrainians. So the result is that, you know, the pro-Russian the Russian-speaking ones are pro-Russia, and the others are pro 
America. So Ukraine now is obviously um, it's an important country, uh, but it's kind of being ripped apart or being pulled uh, one side by Russia and the other side by uh, America and of course the West. And when there are elections, the Russians try to get their man in and the Americans try to get their man in. <laughs> so, and of course the Americans, uh, the Russians are known to uh, indulge in seriously dirty tactics. Americans do as well, but the Russians are well known for their um, Novichok um, poison, uh, which they gave to a number of people and dissidents. Um, and certainly the, the previous uh, president of uh, Ukraine, who has perhaps put in a rather uh, sort of uh, crudely and, and, and illegitimately by the Americans, uh, was poisoned by uh, allegedly Russia. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it made a mess of his face and all sorts. Uh, it really, and I, I don't know, I think it killed him in the end, or I'm not sure if he's still alive, but it really made an absolute mess of his uh, his body. All anyway, right. this, this will carry on, right? And uh, the uh, I think uh, the, the USA, you know, the gun lobby, as uh, Biden was talking about it. Uh, five members of the same family were gunned down as well. Do you think he would be successful to ban high machine guns and all this? Well, it would be just a waste of time. Well, I'm not entirely sure what the state of the gun lobby is now, but the gun lobby has been for the, as far back as I can remember, many decades now, one of the most powerful lobbies in the US. And uh, it's had some very powerful supporters and a huge amount of money to support them. So, uh, you know, the Americans have a fascination with guns mm. and they don't like to give their guns up. And even though, you know, so many innocent people die um, as a result of, uh, you know, gun violence, um, it's it's uh, it's it's incredible. I I almost got killed in America. Um, I don't know if I, I never told you that, did I? No, no. Uh, yeah, I almost got killed in America back in 1989. I went there, um, and it tells you, you know, how easily available guns are, and how easily. I mean, you can't imagine that happening here. Well, to a large extent, anyway. I mean, you know, we have gun violence in this country as well, hmm. but it's just more blatant there. I mean, I was uh, in in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, or as they say, Atlanta, Georgia, mm. and um, this is I said summer of '89. Uh, I went over as a, as a, a you know through the British University's North America Club, BUNAC. All right. Um, and um, I was working in a bank there, uh, but I was living. Um, in a, a, a sort of large, um, you could call it a black area uh, called West uh, West End, basically like a Brixton, okay, mm. uh, in in London. So I just happened to know I met somebody on Hajj the year before that, and he said, "Why don't you come and visit me?" And I didn't know where, where he lived. I said, "Okay," I, I just happened to take his details, and it just so happened that I ended up in America the next year. Uh, on this program, and uh, I went to see him, and then I realized what I'd done <laughs> coming to <laughs> this area. Uh, surprise, I, used surprise. Hear, I used to hear gunfire every single night. Every mm. night I used to hear gunfire. Um, and so um, now, I don't know if you've heard of Imam Jamil Al Amin mm. or Hitler Brown, okay. is what he used to be called before Islam. Uh, and he used to be part of the Black Panthers in the 60s. Right. Big, tall, six foot six, six foot seven guy. Very slim, very tall. Um, African American. And uh, he was the, he, you know, he converted to Islam and he was the Imam in, in the local mosque. So, so I went to, and, and he had a shop. Now, the shop is at a high 
um, the sort of elevated the sort of road, and there's a park overlooking, which is at a much much lower yeah mm. uh, elevation, um, and it's a big huge park in America. Everything's big, you know, so the big park, and so it was it was a few hundred yards away that you could see that you know there were some people there, and suddenly um, I, broad daylight, broad daylight. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just going to the shop, and there is Imam Jamil al Amin, yeah, with his AK, with his uh, M16 or you know American military uh, machine gun, yeah, All right, and he, and he's just firing away into the park. He's standing by his right next to his shop. There's about four or five shops along that road, and then and, and they knew me because you know I. I just arrived about a few uh, days or weeks earlier. And um, there he is standing there, big, tall guy. And, and he, I can see him single bullets. And I can see where he is shooting. He's shooting at uh, like a Land Rover or Range Rover and some people there. And typical British style, uh, you know, excuse me, old chap, but what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> And yes. So you, I just went up to him. You thought you thought that it's a movie. You thought it's a movie. There's a gunfight going on here, you know, and he's he's firing live bullets into the park, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? So like, like you know, typical British Englishman, um, hello, old chappy, but you know, and then somebody as I approached him. Someone just one of the brothers there grabbed me from the neck and just pulled me away and threw me into the one of the shops. I says, "Are you crazy? You mad? There's a gunfight going on. <laughs> you can be killed any time. Mm. I could have been killed easy. <laughs> I went right up to him while he was firing away. Right. And uh, he said, "Look, there's some drug dealers." in the park and they're selling drugs to the kids and stuff. And so, you know, we warned them before not to come round, otherwise we're mm. going to, you know, force them out. And that's what he's doing. <laughs> okay, I think uh, let's finish with this one. That's guns for you. That's guns in America. Right. Oh yeah, and and I can tell you, um, um, one of the brothers there, these are all black converts. Uh, he said to me, okay, let's go to a sh shooting range. I had never, I'd never even seen a gun in my life, never mind hold a gun or whatever. Yeah. So I said, okay, let's go. I've never been to a shooting range. Uh, so he opened up his cupboard. There are about 10 guns there, literally. <laughs> you know, it's, it, was, it was just, it, it wasn't real. And he said, oh, this is a Belgian military uh, pistol. And this is an... Uh, a Magnum 45, you know Magnum 45? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a, a pump action shotgun. And this is a bit, I'm thinking, this is not real. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And this is like, you know, in his, not even in, in some safe place, <laughs> in his cupboard. Um. And, and then of course we did go and we had some you know, shooting practice and I can tell you, uh, it, it was, it, I thought, wow, these people, Guns is just everyday thing, normal thing for them. It's, it's, it's a part of their life, yeah? It's very, that's why you, when you ask about the gun lobby, they are immensely powerful because they've got oh. so many supporters. Mm. The Americans don't want to give up their guns. Right, They've okay. got a fascination with guns. All right, let's go to the last issue. Myanmar, you know, uh, a military coup, a lot of uh, casualties, although the... It's actually demonstrations and protests are still peaceful, but uh, the military are using uh, live bullets and many are killed now. Now uh, the, in London, the ambassador was locked out of the, his residence by his uh, deputy or military attache. Well, that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, look, there's been a change of government, military has taken over, so the military wants all its you know, supporters, of course, running their embassies. And this guy clearly was not a supporter of the military. Uh, and uh, some of the people uh, you know, around him, maybe even under him, 
were supporters of the military and so they locked him out. They said, sorry, you know, you don't represent us anymore. So, uh, so they locked him out and that would be the case in any kind of change of government. Uh, dictatorships. Obviously the government wants, sorry? Dictatorships, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, there's been a change of government, whether well, it's dictatorship or democracy. The point is, there's a change of government and the government wants representatives that it is happy with, that support the government. And the representative, an ambassador is, of course, a representative of the government, uh, does not support the government, then the government is going to say goodbye, we're, we're going to replace you. That would happen in a democracy or a dictatorship. Because I think even the military now are moving to the Muslim minority regions, you know, and well, they we saw it, it mainly the military with uh, Buddhist monks and stuff like that Afshin um, uh, guy um, who mobilized the, the the Buddhist priests as well uh, and the military who slaughtered uh, the Rohingya Muslims. So you know we know what they're capable of. And um, what the uh, militias, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim militias, in uh, Myanmar are saying is if the military does not back down, then we're going to take up arms. Right. And yes. If they take up arms, then that's it. There's going to be big massacres happening. Therefore, they want to defend themselves as well. So things can only get worse in, in Myanmar. Do you Once think... The, do... Do you uh, think uh, the, uh, the uh, sun, you know, the sanctions of the United States against the individuals of the military coup would be sufficient to get them to their senses and bring democracy and the civilian well, government? China will support uh, Myanmar and probably Russia would maybe as well. So they've got their supporters. So, you know, American sanctions will have some impact. But you can see, look, uh, how much have American uh, sanctions impacted Iran? They're, they've been strangling Iran, but Iran has still got a reasonably powerful economy, even though the people are obviously are not in a good condition. But when you look at the uh, comparison of the economies, it, uh, the Iranian or the, the, the North uh, um, North Koreans, and you know, it, sanctions will have an impact, but the country will find a way to survive. Just like Qatar. Look at the massive uh, sanctions mm. that the Saudis and the Emiratis and others put on Qatar to strangle it. But survival, you see, survival, you, you will find a way to survive. Okay. And so they built, they, they increased their ties with Turkey, Russia, Iran, and uh, there was nothing that the Saudis could do. So even though they cut off all routes, they stopped them from flying over their airspace. They um, boycotted their goods and all sorts. So sanctions will have some impact, definitely, but not uh, necessarily to destroy the regime. Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. I think we just remind our listeners as well, you can put your comments on admin at Radio Hedge online. And, uh, of course, uh, you know that... Uh, Today at 3.15, there will be, I think, 3.31, I think, the, the new moon is born, but it will not be seen anywhere. It's why we will be going for the 30th of Sha'ban on Monday, and therefore Ramadan, inshallah, will be on Tuesday. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all and to bless us all and help us to reach Ramadan, of course, and help us to fast its days and stand its nights in prayer as well. And we thank our brother Asad Zaman for his contribution as well. May Allah bless him, inshallah. And uh, until inshallah we meet again, we say subhanak Allah wa hamdik, nashaduna astaghfiruka wa tubu lik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And wa assalamu alaikum from me and Ramadan Mubarak to everyone as well. Jazakallah khair.